Let me, let me start just by saying that uh, the views and the opinions that uh, I will be expressing during my presentation uh, do not necessarily represent the views and the opinions of the authority I work for. Um, I was asked to, to talk about uh, um, corporate governance structures from a very interesting perspective, which is the cross-border perspective, and also uh, in the context of uh, financial stability. So what I did mainly was to try to, um, to find a link uh, between uh, corporate governance, the main topic of corporate governance, and uh, um, financial stability. And uh, the assumption that I would like to start from is exactly that uh, inefficient or ineffective banks' corporate governance can end up endangering uh, financial stability. Um, this is one of the uh, lessons one of the lessons we have learned from the uh, global financial crisis, even if, uh, as uh, uh, Matteo was pointing out uh, uh, before, there are even studies arguing exactly the opposite, which is that uh, um, inefficient corporate governance structures uh, uh, did not uh, cause or did not uh, uh, increase the uh, impact um, on, on, on the financial crisis. On the other way, there are studies arguing exactly uh, the opposite. And uh, here, um, the reference is mainly about uh, uh, the inexistence of uh, systems uh, which in some way could uh, uh, allow the bank to keep under control the risks uh, mainly taken by senior management. Um, from a more general perspective, what we can say is that financial stability nowadays is a priority both in the uh, agenda of uh, supervisors and uh, regulators. And uh, um, this is one of the main purposes under the BRRD, for example. Uh, the other uh, very important uh, uh, aim that uh, um, regulators have now is to avoid uh, uh, to use uh, public money in order to rescue banks or uh, more in general financial institutions in crisis. But when uh, we are in front of a crisis and uh, we need to uh, choose between uh, the two aims to pursue, uh, the financial stability should prevail. And uh, we have a clear demonstration of uh, uh, this prevailing importance in uh, a new tool which was introduced uh, under the VRRD, which is called precautionary recapitalization. Um, this tool has been used so far three times, uh, two times in Greece and uh, one time in Italy, and um, we, can, uh, we, can, uh, we can see this tool as a from a practical point of view as a uh, bailout which uh, takes place uh, before the crisis of the bank actually materializes. Um, it's, uh, broadly speaking, the use of public money to recapitalize a bank which, even if is not uh, actually insolvent, has shown some criticalities uh, in the application of the um, um, so-called adverse scenario. Uh, of course, given that uh, uh, in this case uh, um, we are supposed to use uh, public money, even the rules on uh, the state aid framework apply. And in order to use this public money, uh, we need to meet a number of uh, requirements. Um, also, the ECB has provided a definition, and it's an interesting one. A precautionary capitalization describes the injection of own funds into a solvent bank by the state when this is necessary to remedy a serious disturbance in the economy of a member state and preserve financial stability. It is an exceptional measure that is conditional on final approval under the European state aid framework. It does not trigger the resolution of the bank. So, what the ECB here is saying is that uh, in order for this tool to be applied, um, this tool needs to be 
necessary in order to avoid a serious disturbance of the economy, which is the case in which uh, the failure of a bank uh, which is not submitted uh, to precautionary recapitalization can endanger the financial stability of the member state or, more in general, the financial stability of the union banking system. And uh, when we are facing such a crisis, we are, allowed, we are still allowed to use public money. Of course, the use of public money needs to be compliant with the rules of the 2013 banking communications, which provide a number of uh, requirements ne uh, which need to be, to be met. In particular, um, the fact that uh, um, uh, before, before the state aid measures can uh, take place, um, uh, a business plan and a restructuring plan need to be approved by, uh, by the Commission. The state aid needs to be of a temporary nature, it must be proportionate, and uh, it needs to take place after shareholders and subordinated creditors have, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, suffered the losses first. When uh, we talk about precautionary recapitalization, the, the most critical aspect to take into consideration is the meaning of the expression serious disturbance in the economy. And in order to, to try to define what this expression means, uh, we need to go to uh, the Treaty on the Functioning on, uh, of the European Union, where it is used more or less the same expression. And uh, uh, looking back at the 2007-2008 financial crisis, this was believed to be uh, something uh, which uh, could be considered as a serious disturbance in the, in the, in the economy. And uh, for this very reason, uh, in front of that crisis, um, state aid measures were allowed. Um, on this, at, on, I mean, what also we need to, to take into consideration is the fact that there are no qualitative or quantitative thresholds, which in turn means that uh, supervisors have kind of uh, freedom in determining if uh, uh, we are in front of all the conditions which are required by the law in order to apply this tool. Just to give you some examples, when uh, precautionary capitalization took place with regard to Montepaschi in Italy, there were other two banks facing a crisis which were supposed to be allowed to, to get benefit of the same tool, and here I'm referring to Veneto Banca and Banca Popolare di Vicenza, but in order for these banks to be allowed to be precautionary capitalized, they needed to be considered insolvent by the ECB. They were considered uh, solvent till uh, I think June, by the ECB on the grounds of the fact that they were also issuing bonds with state guarantees, but then the ECB determined that the, these banks were not solvent anymore, and uh, by being not solvent anymore, they were not, no longer allowed to access the precautionary capitalization. Um, As I was telling you before, one of the conditions in order to make use of public money is the application of burden sharing. From a practical point of view, burden sharing is a mechanism which works exactly as bail-in. The only difference is that uh, it applies just to shareholders and uh, subordinated uh, bondholders. And in order to make use of public money, the 2013 banking communication by the uh, EU Commission uh, requires uh, the application of this tool to both shareholders and uh, bond, subordinated bond holders. So, as I was telling you before, I was trying to investigate the interplay, in, the interplay between uh, uh, corporate governance and uh, financial stability, and uh, I mainly came across uh, with uh, some studies uh, arguing that uh, uh, inefficient uh, corporate governance structures uh, 
were one of the many reasons for uh, many banks uh, uh, going to insolvency uh, during, during the global financial crisis. And this was exactly the same approach which was taken by the European Commission in the Green Paper that they published in 2010. And actually this, is, this seems to me also the legal basis for all the legislative initiatives which were taken after the global financial cri crisis, mainly the CRD4. Um, probably what we need to do before, before going uh, uh, in, uh, in more detail is try to understand what, the, what, what, what is the meaning of the expression corporate governance. And here, I mean, there are a huge literature investigating the problem. Here, for, for, for your convenience, I just put the definition that the European Commission provided uh, uh, within the green paper I was mentioning before. And it's a kind of uh, broad definition the Commission has defined it under, uh, underlying that uh, it refers to relations between a company's senior management, its board of directors, its shareholders and other stakeholders, such as employees and their representatives. It also determines the structures used to define a company's objectives as well as the means of achieving them and of monitoring the results obtained. So it's a broad definition where you can find a bit of everything, but mainly it seems to refer to the relations between the uh, top level people within the bank. The other aspect to take into consideration when we uh, talk about banks' corporate governance is the fact that uh, banks are special firms, and this specialness uh, arises from many different peculiar aspects. On one side, we can, uh, we can claim that banks are special due to the uh, special kind of uh, business uh, they are engaged in. And uh, the other peculiar aspect is the fact that uh, uh, they have a significant number of stakeholders which are involved in their operations. Uh, another specific aspect to take into consideration when we think about banks' corporate governance is the fact that uh, the way in which commercial banks make profits is mainly based on the maturity mismatch between uh, uh, their assets and their liabilities. And of course this can also impact on uh, their operations mainly when uh, uh, counterparty risk and liquidity risk materialize. And often it can also happen that these two types of risks materialize at the same time. Um, they also have a significant, by definition, by nature, they also have a significant number of creditors. And uh, the other interesting aspect is that uh, creditors Creditors' interest can, uh, can be in contrast with the interests of, uh, of shareholders. And this can impact on the decision-making process of the bank as such. I don't know why these slides uh, came up this way anyway. Um, on the basis of these preliminary considerations, what we can argue is that uh, uh, effective, uh, effective corporate governance arrangements uh, are the ones that are apt to properly perceive, price and monitor at any time the risks the bank is taking on. It seems to me that uh, even uh, the CRD4 is uh, mainly about uh, how the bank uh, deals with risk. Um, I think we, we, we heard in the previous presentation how much importance is given to uh, the proper setting of the risk committee, uh, the proper setting of uh, systems which allow the bank to keep under control the risk at any time. So to me the risk is uh, a crucial element for efficient corporate governance and uh, moving the perspective from, from, from the opposite point we can also argue that uh, efficient corporate governance arrangement, arrangements are the ones which uh, allow the bank to uh, uh, 
perceive on a steadily basis the risk that uh, I would say mainly senior, senior management is taking on on behalf of the bank itself. We can also argue that uh, um, banks' corporate governance can be considered as the first tool to prevent crisis, as a kind of uh, supervisory tool, which of course uh, uh, comes into, uh, into place before the actual supervision performed by supervisors. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, tool uh, can only work if uh, uh, the uh, inherent arrangements put in place uh, effective mechanisms. Um, this is uh, because uh, um, decision makers need to always have a clear picture in front of them of uh, the risks that uh, the bank is taking on, because only in this way they, they can be in a position to promptly react by decreasing the level of risk if they realize that uh, this level of risk is no longer compliant with the risk appetite framework that the bank itself is supposed to build. Looking back at uh, the experience from the global financial crisis uh, on the basis of what the European Commission argued in the Green Paper from 2010, uh, what we can uh, say is that uh, at that point in time, boards of directors did not properly fulfill their main role, which is uh, mainly to take uh, beneficial decisions for their institution. And uh, according to what the European Commission said in that paper, the reason for this were mainly, among them, uh, the fact that, uh, as someone of you was uh, uh, pointing out before, um, there was not a I would say a full understanding by many directors of uh, the activities which the bank uh, were performing. There was not a full understanding of what the senior management was doing. There was not uh, a full understanding of the executive di of what the executive directors were doing, and. Uh, in turn, this is the result of many different factors. These factors can be, uh, can be seen, for example, in the fact that uh, in most cases, uh, board, boards of directors were made up of people lacking sophisticated banking skills, allowing them to properly understand what was going on and also to try to challenge the decisions adopted by executive directors and by the senior management. In order to try to uh, address in some way all these issues that the global financial crisis clearly as shown as some legislative initiative, initiatives in the meantime have been, have been taken. And here I'm referring to mainly um, the CRD4 and also to the BRRD, where are some rules impacting directly or indirectly on banks' corporate governance. Um, these new rules uh, uh, are uh, a kind of, uh, I would say, the impact on many different aspects of uh, the corporate governance structures of, uh, of banks. For example, the composition of the board, um, the way in which uh, internal committees have to be set out within uh, the board itself, and so on and so forth. But uh, when we look at the European legislation, we also need to, uh, to keep in mind that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the different jurisdictions across the EU, there are different corporate governance uh, models. I try to sum up here in this slide uh, the three main uh, corporate governance uh, structures which are adopted in uh, three different uh, EU jurisdictions. The British model, the German model, and the Italian model. The British model is a one-tier system made up of a single board composed of both executive and 
on executive independent directors. The former are in charge for the daily business operations, whilst the latter are meant to control whether the bank is properly run. The German model instead is a two-tier system with a management board in charge to run the bank and a supervisory board whilst the Italian model is based on the division of functions between the board of directors in charge to set the guidelines and the goals that the senior management has to follow and the board of independent auditors which is just supposed to control the legality of the activities performed by both the senior management and the, the, uh, the board itself. Um, the other, the other tendency which uh, I think we can uh, recognize by looking at the initiatives which were taken by the legislators after the global financial crisis is, uh, uh, is for example, the significant, uh, the increasing importance which has been given to the presence of independent and non-executive directors uh, within the board. And th the reason for this to me is mainly that uh, the presence of uh, independent and non-executive directors should uh, ease in some way the dialogue uh, within the board on the basis of the consideration that uh, when there is a flowing dialogue between uh, different uh, directors, this is the best way to allow the board itself uh, to make thoughtful decisions. Of course, the counter-argument here could be that the involvement of uh, non-executive directors uh, who do not have uh, a full knowledge of the daily facts which uh, uh, come up on a daily basis are not in a good position to make uh, proper decision, but still uh, a broader board where a variety of uh, directors are involved in the decision making process is uh, in the legislator view the best way to end up uh, uh, taking good and beneficial decisions for the institution. The other tendency that uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can notice looking back at what the EU legislator have, uh, has done so far in terms of uh, corporate governance is a significant uh, uh, increase of the level of sophistication of the skills which are required for directors in order to be, to be appointed. Again, on the basis of the consideration that before the crisis, it was often the case of having boards with uh, people sitting uh, without uh, sophisticated skills and uh, technical knowledge of what a banking institution is supposed to do uh, to perform its uh, own business. Um, I tried to sum up uh, the two main uh, policy makers uh, initiatives which were uh, adopted before the, uh, after the global financial crisis. Here there is a mention of the Green Paper published by the EU Commission in 2010, which I already uh, mentioned, where it is clearly stated that uh, although corporate governance did not directly cause the crisis, the lack of effective control mechanisms contributed significantly to excessive risk taking on the part of financial institutions. And again, the uh, solution which the uh, European Commission envisaged in that paper was to try to enhance the level of sophistication of directors in order to be appointed in the board, the involvement of m more uh, non-executive directors and uh, the involvement of more independent directors as well as uh, limits on the number of directorships that each individual can hold. Uh, we were listening uh, to um, a, present a presentation uh, before in which uh, I think uh, you, were, you were telling us that uh, there were cases of individuals holding something like 50 uh, directorships, which of course uh, uh, is a case uh, uh, which by definition does not allow this individual to properly perform and to properly devote enough time to each single directorship. 
Um, the other significant uh, um, policy makers initiative was the publication by the uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision of its uh, corporate governance principles for banks in July 2015. For your convenience, I put here a kind of uh, um, list of these uh, principles that uh, you, can, uh, you can read if you, if you like to punish yourself. Um, from the point of view of the um, legislative initiatives, I would say that uh, both the CRD4 and the BRD now play a significant role in uh, uh, corporate governance arrangements for banks. Um, What is interesting to me is the fact that uh, the CRD4, uh, moving from what the European Commission uh, uh, stated back in 2010, clearly states that uh, institutions shall have robust governance arrangements, effective processes to identify, manage, monitor and report the risks. Again, the conclusion is that uh, um, the proper perception of risk and uh, systems allowing the bank to steadily uh, perceive, monitor and control the risk is uh, the main way to uh, properly allow the bank to uh, well perform. From the BRD perspective, there was a mention yesterday uh, by, I think, Anna Gardella, saying that uh, uh, the supervisory authorities now have the power to remove uh, uh, members of, uh, uh, of the board of directors if they think that they are no longer fit and proper to hold that, uh, that appointment. And to me, this seems a kind of very intrusive power, which, uh, to my knowledge, uh, was used uh, back in 2015 uh, uh, with regard to an Italian bank. And it's intrusive because uh, this is uh, a clear example of uh, uh, the possibility for supervisory authorities to intervene in the way in which uh, um, the board should be, should be composed. The other, the other significant power is, uh, again, given to supervisory authorities and it's re represented by the possibility for them to ask a bank to change uh, its uh, legal structure, which is pretty interesting because, for example, it was used uh, by many scholars to justify uh, um, reform adopted back in 2015 in Italy where the legislator imposed uh, to the uh, biggest uh, popular banks, which were cooperative banks, to convert into so-called società operazioni, limited, uh, um, limited liability companies by shares, in order to enhance, uh, that's, what, uh, that, that's the, argue, the argument that the legislator used, in order to enhance uh, their corporate governance uh, structures. Um, given that I was asked to try to look at uh, cross-border perspectives, I tried to uh, come up with two uh, significant, I think, experiences uh, looking at uh, two different uh, um, legislative initiatives which were taken in Greece and uh, in Italy. The Greek legislator has decided to significantly raise the professional skills that are required in order for a di director to be appointed. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, the other mandatory rule is that uh, each single board needs to have at least a member who is an expert in dealing with non-performing loans. Of course, the rationale for this rule is based on the grounds that uh, Greek banks are still full of non-performing loans, so in order to enhance and to foster the way in which uh, these banks uh, deal with this problem, uh, they talked to uh, make mandatory the involvement of an expert in the board. 
significant is also the Italian legislative choice to uh, adopt a reform back in 2016 impacting on uh, uh, cooperative mutual banks, so-called Banca di Credito Cooperativo, which are small and local institutions um, characterizing by the fact that their boards of directors are usually made up of uh, people who are well known at local level where the bank operates, but uh, often they do not have uh, sophisticated technical skills in the banking sector. So in order to try to uh, um, increase the quality of uh, and say the skills of uh, the people who are involved in the board, they decided to, practically speaking, move the power to select and appoint the, the members of the board from the shareholder meetings of the bank to the holding company, which is a kind of uh, peculiar holding company, given that it's not put uh, at the top of uh, the control chain, but at the bottom. And uh, this uh, holding company controls uh, um, the, the other banks uh, belonging to the same group uh, on the basis of a contract. Um, in the view of the legislator, this uh, legislative initiative should allow the, should, let's say, ease the involvement of uh, um, proper, let's say, uh, directors who are uh, well placed to make a thoughtful decision in the interest of, uh, of the bank. Um, some concluding remarks. Uh, I think that the global financial crisis has clearly shown that for banking and financial institutions risk management is of crucial importance. Only by properly managing the risk, such institutions can survive the next uh, uh, market turmoil, which uh, of course will happen at some point. And uh, in order to, to be placed in a better position to manage all these risks, legislators uh, came up with a number of uh, significant mechanisms, which, uh, uh, trying to simplify, are let's say, I'm at uh, allowing in a more efficient way the banks to keep under control the risk. Of course, we are not uh, yet in the position to judge if these new rules are efficient because it will take time, but uh, the first conclusion that uh, I think we are already able to provide is that the system at least on paper, seems to be more efficient that, than uh, it was the case before the global financial crisis. Questions?